Okay, while they're getting, making their way out, just a good morning to you. My name is Craig Rebro. I'm one of the elders here in White River. I'm very happy that you're here. And I'm going to just start in prayer, uh, mostly for me. <laughs> Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity to share. Uh, don't take it lightly. Uh, I pray that your message goes out, not, a, not any clever words from me, but just through the power of the Holy Spirit, as Olivia was talking about. Uh, we pray that, Holy Spirit, you are here. You help us to understand your word, uh, understand it well, that you will uh, even even uh, challenge us with this word. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, for my intro to my intro, please turn to Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. And while you're doing that, I just want to tell you, I want to share something pretty amazing. This, this message that I'm sharing with you today, I've had probably no less than six confirmations as I've been preparing. And before this message today, someone handed me this piece of paper. She didn't know what I was preaching about. And so this is what, she, what it says. When you go, know that I am the one sending you. I am sending you to the nations. You will go in the power of the Holy Spirit. My spirit is with you when you go. <laughs> and then when the, the sermon title came up, um, which is, on your marks, get set, go, she just about fell over. So I, I feel like this is confirmation that this message is for our church and for you. And so I'm going to start in Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. So one other confirmation, Richard shared with me that the Band of Brothers actually did a study on this at the end of the year last year. I didn't even know that. So I love how the Spirit just weaves together everything. So with that as a backdrop, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, as I said, my, my message is, ti is titled, On Your Marks, Get Set, Go, and there's a debate whether it's On Your Mark or On Your Marks, Get Set, Go, but we'll stick with On Your Marks. I guess there's, this is kind of two, or is it one? I don't know. I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, so, we've been in a series called Engage over the last few weeks. Guy spoke about engaging through community and about the dynamic church. And last week, Ian spoke about engaging through Christian stewardship and living, a, living it out God's way. And today, I have the privilege to talk to you about engaging through going. And I've had chunks of this message prepared for some time, but it wasn't until this week that I was able to pull everything together. In fact, I was really encouraged by our meeting on Wednesday night. We broke the fast together. It was 25 words given um, that night from the front. The people were lined up from here all the way around to the back. I don't know if that's ever happened in this church before. Um, and at the end, what makes it so encouraging was one of the clear threads was to go. And so I was thinking, okay, Lord, this is good. I'm, I'm on the right track, I think. In fact, two of the scriptures that were given from the front were my anchor scriptures for today. So that was confirmation for me, and my personal revelation from the fast was, it's time. I won't get into the whole how I got that, but that's confirmation for me that it's time to go. So what does that mean? For me, going is what my wife and I do for a living. Um, it's what Sanani does. Uh, it's, it's a privilege that Brendan and I have to lead an NGO or NPO, but if you're not familiar with what Sanani is, it's the regional outreach, I guess, arm or, or entity for Church Unlimited. So we have a lot of opportunity to go, but much of what we do is a regional focus. But today I want to focus more on the Judea and the Samaria opportunities for 2023, meaning going to places further than your hometown 
and being around people that aren't from here. And I don't think I could give a message about going if I didn't refer to Acts 1.8. You can turn to it if you'd like, um, and I've already kind of referred to it, but let me read it. Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Olivia didn't know what I was preaching about, and, and so I thank her for the, um, the intro <laughs> unknowingly. Um, but this verse is often quoted from, you will be my witnesses, leaving out, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So first, it's very important to acknowledge that we need His power when we go to be effective. Second, where will you be witnesses? What does the Scripture say? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that really means here, there, and everywhere. So for the born-again believer, we need the Holy Spirit's power to be effectively to be effective for Jesus, uh, to be an effective witness for, for Jesus. And the good news is, if you're born again, meaning you've made the decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have it. But many of us forget to tap in to that power we've been given. You probably heard, if, if you're not new to the church, you've probably heard Guy talk about apostolic visits. And for those that haven't grown up in the church, or maybe you're new to this one, this might sound like a, an intimidating, churchy word. But all it means is doing what the apostles did. Simply, the apostles were a group of Christians who traveled to different places telling people about Jesus. That's an apostolic visit. Mission, that's one of those other sometimes misunderstood or overly used Christianized words, and it's usually associated with a going Christian or the military. The Cambridge Dictionary's definition is an important job that someone is sent somewhere to do. So then what is a missionary? One definition is a person who has been sent to a foreign country to teach their religion to people who are there. For us, this means going somewhere to tell them about Jesus that will involve positive change from the gospel message. And as a result, there's change in us. We experience the Holy Spirit's power working through us and we want to do it more. Change in others, they get to experience new life through Jesus, through salvation and the Holy Spirit, and changing the world. The multiplication of this like a felled fire. Are you with me so far? Okay. So what does the Lord do when we go with an apostolic heart? He reveals, he empowers, and he shows you things in the spiritual while we are in the process of going. We can't do the work without the Holy Spirit and his power. And that alone is a bit difficult to explain. Explaining the mysteries of Revelation, those things are best understood through experience. But... If we simply follow the example of the apostles, it simplifies things. This is how they went, as apostles in team, experiencing the amazing revelations of Christ and witnessing the power of the Holy Spirit on full display around them and in and through them. It's no different today. Brenda and I debated about my message and she, she was saying, you must tell them it's about salvations and bringing people to Christ. And, and you should, and it is, and she's right. And that is the reason we go. But what I feel often is left out is what happens during and afterwards to those who said yes and made the decision to go to get out of their comfort zone. In fact, I believe that's why some people don't go because they don't understand what it means to go. So I'm talking about the peripheral blessings and experiences that come with a decision to go. 
I don't think there's anything wrong with discussing that. In fact, it's meant to be an encouragement to walk into things that the Lord has for you. One of my favorite things is hosting international teams and visitors who come to South Africa and they join the work that we do. I love when they come so eager because they want to make a difference and then God makes the difference in them. Selfishly, I get to experience God working in the hearts of people. I get to see God set the hook in people's hearts and when they go back home, they go away changed for the better. God gives them an upgraded lens to see the world around them differently, and they get to keep it. As Ian said last week, when you live it out God's way, the miraculous happens. When people say yes to going, they forget about their material things or their agendas because God is using them to introduce his son to others. And nothing else matters when that is happening. The freedom that comes with this is priceless. In fact, that is why people give their time, their talent, and their earnings to travel from all over the world to go on mission trips. They are yearning to be used in such a miraculous, transformational way. It's like locking arms with Jesus when you step out in faith this way. These are the things that create powerful testimonies that encourage others to do the same. And while we go, like the apostles, we get the privilege to experience what the Lord reveals. And this is what makes it so amazing and exciting. Okay, so let's see if you were paying attention. So just to reiterate, apostolic visits are church people simply doing what the apostles did. Doing the important job of going to places, spreading the gospel, and changing people's lives. Is that only for Guy or Leon to do? No way. It's for all of us. It's the dynamic church Guy spoke about two weeks ago. Going equals positive change by introducing people to Jesus. It's change in you by allowing God to use you powerfully, creating testimonies that glorify him. It gives you confidence and courage to continue running. A going spirit becomes part of who you are. It's changing others, being given the greatest gift on earth, Jesus himself. They become new creations with freedom in Christ. What a privilege to watch the lost get found. And it's changing the world. Going changed the world with only 12 men to start. But there is much more to do. Acts 17.6 talks about these people who have turned the world upside down. In such a chaotic world, wouldn't it be fun to get ahead of the chaos? Maybe cause a little bit of our own chaos for Jesus by turning the world upside down? That excites me. Being on the offensive is far better than deflecting arrows all the time. In church, we can be that to a fallen world. I'm sure just about everyone has heard the common phrase, on your marks, get set, go. And it was used in the early 1800s to begin foot races. It's a phrase often uh, being used to start a competition. And so on your marks means get in your lane or your spot. Get set is to get into starting position. And go is to take off running. And so just to expand a little further, the word mark referred to a place on the running course where the runner would start whether it's a line or a set of of starting blocks like that, get set is sort of that warning that it's about time to start running. And the word go, of course, means it's time to run. So could I ask my helpers to come up? So my question is, what is your posture related to running the race for the Lord? Is it sitting on your hands? Is it in the starting blocks? Or are you already running? Okay, I want, hopefully it's not that one. (laughs) My, My job today is to get you not sitting on your hands. Okay, thanks guys. 
You can give him a round of applause. If <laughs> <laughs> okay, I started with Hebrews 12.1. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer or author and perfecter of faith. My question is, have you found your lane yet? Have you got set? Are you sensing a stirring in your heart? And if so, it's time to take off and start running. So I've given messages before about going, serving, or being more involved with outreach. And all to highlight what the Bible says about it and why it should matter to us. And I just want to say, going has nothing to do with your ability. It has everything to do with your obedience. If you go, God does the rest. I'm going to just pause because as we were having coffee, someone says, someone was saying to me, you know, I get into the starting blocks and then I feel like, oh, I have to go back and prepare more. I have to take a class. I have to get a certification. No, you don't. God does the rest in your obedience. So that's the power I was referring to earlier in the preach. In 1 Corinthians 4.20, it says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. And don't get me wrong, if you need to use words, he will give them to you. But it's not our clever words that the change will happen. It's in the going that God does the empowering. All right, I'm going to reference Hebrews 12.1 again, but focusing on the first part this time, where it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And if you're like me, sometimes you read scripture and you don't understand it. And I, I hope I'm not the only one. But I got stuck on, on that. I got stuck on, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, I wanted to know what this meant more deeply. Who are these witnesses? So the key here is the word, Therefore, this means it's a continuation from the previous chapter. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses who are spoken about in the previous chapter, refers to the heroes of the faith that came before us. Sometimes we think our Christian life is just about us. If we don't grow, if we don't thrive, no one will be bothered, but that's not true. There could be a whole other preach about just that. But think about this for a minute. There is an audience in heaven cheering you on. A cloud of witnesses. That's what the scripture is saying. These are the people who pleased God by choosing faith and who relied on God's help to live out that faith well. As it says in Hebrews 11, these people are Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, and David. But guess what? It's not just the famous saints in heaven who make, out, make up the cloud of witnesses, but the many people throughout history who have decided to live a life in faith. For me, this changed my perspective on the race that I'm running. We aren't just representing ourselves. I imagine a stadium full of people who have ran a good race and are constantly at the ready to cheer us on with our journey with Jesus. On the 28th of December, I was asked to help um, with the photography at Hannah Garrett's wedding. Some of you know the Garretts, they usually sit right over there. And one of the blessings of being a photographer is getting let in on those intimate moments that most people don't get to see. I kind of get a backstage pass. And I hadn't met the groom before, but I was with the groomsmen as they were getting ready, and you start to catch a vibe of what they're about and who they are. I overheard him talking to his mates, and he was saying, yeah, I want to be an elder one day. And then his dad came in, and there was this beautiful exchange where he was praying for him. At the ceremony, the bridesmaids were unashamedly praising Jesus. Hannah was leading the way, arms raised to the king at the altar. I would say there was a high percentage of people that were born-again believers there, many who, who live their lives in faith. And being in that environment does something to even the most devout Christian. It encourages everyone to focus on Jesus, 
to honor him and to praise and worship him freely. It was so beautiful. There's a spirit-filled fragrance that saturates such occasions, which should include our Sunday services. There was a cloud of witnesses cheering on the bride and the groom. And dare I say, I believe we can model this scripture since we are surrounded by such a cloud of great uh, such a great cloud of witnesses here on earth. As scripture says, on earth as it is in heaven. You're probably saying, can you get off of Hebrews 12.1? Nope. <laughs> Dissecting Hebrews 12.1 even further, let's look at throwing off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. In my experience, those that do this are the ones that decided to chase after the plans and purposes God has, uh, has for them. They have stories to tell. They have testimonies. They are living a life in a way that doesn't subscribe to everyday norms. They're fun to be around. And they are interesting to talk to. They are running the race marked out for them. I don't know about you, but I never want life to just happen to me. Those that live that way often find themselves complaining about their circumstances. Rather, bring your wildest dreams to him and see what he does and be expectant. That race that's marked out for you has beautiful people, amazing scenery, and incredible experiences that come along the way. If you read your Bible, it's full of amazing stories of people who had faith to do what God said, and we're still talking about them thousands of years later. And I won't embarrass anyone, but I can pick out many individuals and many families right here and tell you their testimonies and their amazing stories. The Lord loves when we go. And if you've never experienced the lavish love of the Lord, it's worth throwing off everything to experience it. And once that happens, you want more. He lavishes his grace, his power, his protection, hidden his love on those who earnestly seek him and then take action. This is what happens when we go. Mornay alluded to it. When, we, when it gets down to it, what do we have to lose? If we believe Jesus came down from heaven, died on the cross, and gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit, how is it that we don't have enough faith to go on one outreach during the year? Do you not think God would be pleased with your decision to throw off all the normal, logical reasons and just trust him? When you go, I guarantee he will show up. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This is an important scripture to me. I interpret it as bringing my whole self, my whole time, my, my life, my comfort, and it's a challenge to us. But are you ready to test him in this? Do you want to see him throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out ridiculous blessing? I know I do. Like Ian and many others, I can speak to this personally. His word is good and his promises are true. I want you all to experience the fullness that comes with a life of faith. Sometimes we overcomplicate the issue. What lane, when, what race, ah, I'm not ready. And then the years keep going by. For me, the race is a marathon, longer than the comrades. And while on the journey, we shouldn't be looking down at our feet. We should be looking around us to enjoy the experiences God gives us along the way. The risk of hand-sitting is others start to pull you off your chair and pull you into their lane in their race. Rather, seek God for what is marked out for you. So as I start to conclude, I've noticed how easy it is to get out of our lane and end up in someone else's lane. 
listening to wrong voices or surrounding yourself with the wrong people can send you off track in a hurry. Even well-intentioned people or Christians can steer you off your path. So don't become a meandering Christian ending up in the weeds. The way to do that and the way to avoid ending up in the weeds is staying in community, prayer, seeking godly counsel, and reading your Bible. Okay. Last point, and then I'll conclude. As I was preparing for this message, I was struck by the distances that Jesus himself walked to reach his destinations. We know Jesus walked between Jerusalem and Nazareth, which is about 137 kilometers. Experts estimate he walked an average of 32 kilometers a day during his ministry in Galilee. So it seems that Jesus did not meander around or accidentally do ministry. I'm sure he could have ridden a horse, taken a chariot, or some faster means of travel, but other than the times he was in a boat, he walked. Jesus would have had to have been intentional. There had to be planning if you're going to walk 32 kilometers a day, especially if he was visiting places where temperatures can reach 43 degrees. The point is, Jesus knew where he was going, but I also believe he left margin in his plans simply by the way he traveled. Walking allowed him to teach, preach, and perform miracles amongst people. He would go, but he stayed in the lane marked out for him. He was intentional, and he walked deliberately with a sense of urgency. Jesus had limited amount of time on earth. I think he knew this, and he knew he had a mission to accomplish. Have you ever thought the same thing applies to us? We don't know how long we have here, so my question is, do we live a life with a sense of urgency to live out the call that we have as Christians? Let me end with this. At the end of every year, my family speaks, uh, seeks the Lord for a guiding scripture. And so ours for 2023 is Psalm 23, 1 through 3. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths. You can imagine my excitement when Richard preached on Psalm 23 on January 1. I wanted to remind us that God himself leads us, as it says in Psalm 23. He leads us beside quiet waters, and he guides us along the right paths, the right lanes, so we can run our race. Seek your path your trail, your lane, because there is one that's marked out for you. Guys, a dynamic church is a going church, and a growing Christian is a going Christian. So we're going to do something as a bit of a response. My hope is that your, your, your spirit was stirred a little bit today, but I wanted to take the mystery out of going, if I could, and you might be saying, I'd like to go, but where? So I'm going to put a slide up if it's not already. And I want to show you all the opportunities that, with just this church that we have for going in 2023. Can you imagine if CU White River was sending out teams of people all over the world? People full of faith to go. I think we'd, our church would look different. So can I invite uh, Mariessa up? So here's what we're going to do. I'd like us to seek the Lord in the going. We're going to spend a few minutes. Mariessa's going to play a song. And then for those of you that feel like the Lord is speaking to you, we're going to have you come up to the front, and we're going to pray for you. If you could dim the lights for me. So just take some time. There's no rush, no hurry. Seek him for... Where does he ask him? Where do you want me to go? 